Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamualaikum and hello. I'm so grateful to welcome you all today. Um, I know that it's the end of the workday. It's a random Tuesday. Uh, the week has just begun, so I'm grateful that you have chosen to spend the next hour, 90 minutes with us. Uh, my name is Nadia Mohajer, and I am the executive director at Heart to Grow. Heart is a national nonprofit that was founded um, in 2010 um, that advances reproductive justice and uh, promotes gender-based violence prevention programming in Muslim communities. Uh, and we do that through our acronym, which is Health Education Advocacy Research and Training. For the almost for the last almost 15 years, I can't believe it, um, we are proud to have been one of the leading uh, national nonprofits. Uh, led by Muslim women um, and have trained thousands of young people, Muslim leaders, institutions, and social service professionals on how to respond to and prevent sexual violence in Muslim communities. And today we uh, want to share the empirical data that supports the work that we do every day. So as someone who's trained in public health and a data geek at heart, um, I'm, you know, really, um, grateful and happy that we are finally here today to be able to share the results of our first national study uh, that was exploring the prevalence of sexual violence, sexual dysfunction, and spiritual abuse in Muslim communities in the U.S. and Canada. We actually started this four years ago, um, and it was right before we launched it literally like a week before the world shut down because of COVID, um, and we didn't really know what to expect. Um, we got not only a sizable sample, but we were also able to get a fairly diverse sample um, given the circumstances. Um, and the results, you know, while they're not surprising to us just because we, you know, are doing this work every day, um, we do find them to be very compelling and uh, perhaps um, surprising or a little um, shocking to those who aren't in this work every day. Um, so before I um, end, I wanted to first uh, give some gratitude out. Um, a lot of the research team that has been um, at the forefront of this work um, is here today. So this uh, four years ago, this started with Hadi Cisse, doctor, who is now a doctor, Dr. Hadi Cisse, um, who um, together with another intern of ours, Mona Bidawi from Southern California, um, began on this journey of designing a survey for us to kind of seek that, uh, um, explore the prevalence of sexual violence. And then we have Yasmin Khair um, from the Center for Urban Research and Learning at Loyola. Her um, director and boss and my good friend, David Van Zeitfeld um, from CURL. CURL has been a very, very um, dear and beloved partner to us in the last 10 years or for the last 10 years. And so I'm really grateful to have them there. And then we have Hera Sayed, who has been helping us do the actual um, um, it, translating the data analysis to something that lay community members can um, interact with. Um, and we have Sabrine Muhammad, who is our um, manager of health education, who joined the team about two years ago and has been working to get the visual report out um, as one of her first projects. So all of us are relieved in a variety of different ways. And so I'm really grateful um, that we are all here together. And we also have a few other um, researchers that are named in the report that aren't able to join us today, but our two co-PIs, um, Dr. Samina Rahman and Dr. Wajiha Akhtar and Gina Spitz, who's also at CURL. Um, so just want to name that we have a very large uh, research team and very excited um, that a lot of us have been able to be here today. So finally, as you hear about the results, um, we are going to ask that you take care of yourself. Um, you know, given our own lived experiences and the work that we do, we know that trauma is always present with us in the room and heart's work um, over the years has been heartbreaking. It's also been beautiful. We've built a space that has offered healing and belonging to so many people. And 
we also know that our work will regularly bring up a lot of mixed emotions. And so we're here to support after, if you need to process, during, um, you can private message me, um, any of the other co-hosts on the, on the chat box. Um, and we can hope, uh, hopefully direct you to the resources that you need. Um, and we ask that you, you know, do what you need to in this moment to care for yourself as emotions emerge. With that, I am going to um, uh, pass it over to my colleague, Sahara Pirzada, who um, will be helping just ground the space um, so that we can begin the presentation. Thank you, Sahara. Thank you, Nadia, and congratulations to my incredible colleagues for the launch of this important report. Um, I wanted to start us off uh, with a quick dua uh, or supplication. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbi shrah li sabri wa yassir li amri wa ahla lakhlatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. I'm going to read the English translation of this, which is, My Lord, expand for me my breast with assurance and ease for me my task and untie the knot from my tongue that they may understand my speech. I mean, um, so much important information is about to be shared. And so just bringing into the space, uh, you know, the desire that it be received um, with a lot of ease and uh, also that this information be used in, in ways to better our, our communities, inshallah. Um, for the grounding, I, I wanted to take us through a quick breathing exercise. Um, please take what works for you, leave what doesn't. Everything is an invitation and in the spirit of being trauma-informed. Um, you know, this is all about consent. So please take um, that which works for you. Uh, if you feel comfortable doing so, please take your hands and just place them on your legs, facing downwards. Feel the texture of the fabric beneath you, the material beneath you. Feel free to gently lower your gaze or close your eyes. Take a deep inhale in through the nose. And exhale out through the mouth. Another deep inhale in through the nose. One, two, three, and hold. And exhale out through the mouth. One, two, three, four. Maybe at this point you want to take your shoulders and just roll them back. Doing that a few times just to release any tension. Maybe it feels good to have your right ear meet your right shoulder and just hold it there for a few seconds. And have your chin meet your chest down below. Hold for a few seconds. and have your left ear meet your left shoulder. Ever so gently appreciating all that it is that our bodies can do and hold and appreciating that it can also release when needed. Maybe bring your head back up so the crown of your head is upright. Take another deep inhale in through the nose and exhale out through the mouth. Recognizing that whatever messages our body is giving us is our rahma, is a form of compassion to ourselves. These messages should be received with compassion and treated with care. These are gifts to us, letting us know levels of safety, letting us know what our needs might be, how we might need to be treated or adjustments needed to be made. 
as you go through the session today, uh, please take care as needed, whether that means being on or off camera, nourishing yourself with food and drink as needed, or grounding by touching anything nearby that reminds you of being present. Thank you all and congratulations again to the team. And good luck everyone as you're listening to today's incredible information. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you, Seher, for leading us into this grounding. Um, I hope that everybody felt it and I hope that we're all grounded. Um, my name is Sabrina Mohammed. I am the manager of health equity and education with Heart. And I've been on the team for two years, as Nadia mentioned earlier. And I'm really, really excited to be moderating this conversation. But I want to start with having one of our lead researchers, Jasmine Khair, go over some of the data, some of the results before we start the conversation with the researchers. Thank you. And I'll just wait for the slides to go. So if you'll see, there's a poll question that's popped up. Um, so I'm gonna read it out loud and if folks feel comfortable responding, please do so. So it says, do you feel comfortable discussing issues related to sexual violence openly within your community? So this will be just interesting to have information before we dive into some of the findings themselves and then before our um, moderated Q&A session. So as people um, answer that question, I'll go ahead and get started um, with the slides. I'll try and be brief with like all the setup to this because I really want us to focus on the major findings of, um, of our work. So if you want to go to the next slide. So like I said, we'll go, um, I'll share a little bit about kind of the background to the study, um, our aims and objectives for the study, um, the specific research questions that we use, the methodologies, and then spend most of my time um, going through our major findings, um, which will kind of set us up for the panel discussion. Next slide. So um, just to kind of ground us a little bit, all of our work, um, you know, always starts with like a pretty in-depth dive into kind of present research at hand, present information that we have about sexual violence. Um, and so just here, we're kind of noting that um, according to the CDC, um, one in three women and one in nine men in the United States experience some form of sexual abuse um, over their lifetime. Um, Another one of our major kind of grounding points for this work was the National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey, um, as it noted that 47.6% of um, women experienced some form of unwanted sexual contact in their lifetime, um, and 22.4% reported um, completed or attempted rape in their lifetime. And so just kind of grounding in like the mainstream information that we have available um, and noting um how already prevalent this this uh issue of sexual violence is in our mainstream society um but then also recognizing that a lot of this data is really focusing on white um white individuals um and with only 30 34.45% of participants identifying as non-white um in terms of racial and ethnic groups um and so next slide so in, in this way we wanted to really focus on um, what's happening in Muslim communities when it comes to sexual violence and how it compares um, in some way to mainstream experiences of sexual violence. Um, but as we, you know, delve into the literature around Muslims and sexual violence, um, there really is limited data um, in terms of, you know, what, um, how folks are experiencing sexual violence um, within very, uh, diverse Muslim communities. And this is often due to many, um, you know, many of the mainstream reports as well as kind of like smaller, small sampled um, Muslim centered research. Um, it's often hard to capture um, those who are 
within the religious, uh, under that religious identity, um, since oftentimes folks are, uh, you know, um, characterized by other demographic points, but within Muslim communities in the US and Canada, often these groups are a huge, you know, mix of racial and ethnic groups, sexual um, identities, gender identities, um, uh, household incomes, academic uh, um, levels, statuses, all these kind of things. And so it's really hard to pinpoint without that religious identity marker who is Muslim and how we can kind of know um, where they kind of lie in terms of sexual violence uh, experiences and then also how they're seeking support. Um, since oftentimes we know that Muslims particularly are experiencing um, very particular uh, and unique challenges when seeking sexual violence uh, or support post-sexual violence. Um, so if you wanna go to the next slide. Um, and so we tried, you know, we also did try to dive into um, what work is available right now in terms of Muslims and sexual violence. Um, and so I've, we've listed like three major ones that we have um, noted um, within the last 10 years or, or so. Um, and I won't go into them more particularly. You can go into the um, report for that a little bit more. But just to note just overall that like folks, you know, the, the research studies that we have seen that are focused on Muslims, um, the rates of sexual violence are very high um, within the samples that we have and that it's happening to folks across, um, you know, it's happening to women, it's happening to immigrants, it's happening to folks on college campuses, it's happening within marriages, within households. Like it's very, um, uh, it's happening across a lot of spaces and we need um, to, there's a lot to explore there. Um, next slide. And so the, you know, main objective of our national study was, you know, really coming out of this huge gap in the literature and the, you know, um, in the ways that research is not really capturing these very um, unique, but also prevalent um, lived experiences by Muslims. Um, and so our goal was to investigate the prevalence of sexual violence, stalking and intimate partner violence um, in Muslim communities in the United States and Canada. And our specific research questions um, included, how do Muslims in North America perceive the prevalence of sexual violence and harassment across Muslim communities as well as what is the actual lived prevalence of sexual violence and harassment in Muslim North American communities. And then we also look into um, how this prevalence varies by gender identity as well as sexual identity. And so the methodology that we um, used was uh, primarily quantitative in nature. Um, we utilized a large scale cross-sectional survey that we um, dispersed um, online via Qualtrics. Um, and so that through like an anonymous link, um, all the participants that were part of the study must have uh, um, self-identified as Muslim and were ages between the ages of 18 and 45 and were current residents of the United States or Canada and were fluent, fluent in English. Um, our sample we obtained through various means and used our networks very um, extensively, but it was very much a convenience and snowball um, non-probability sampling. Um, we were able to reach about 792 participants that were eligible um, and about 529 completed and reached the end of the survey. And so it's just kind of starting um, to get us into these demographic um, information. Um, overall, um, we had, uh, so all of these numbers are um, for each demographic is, a, is around the like 700 um, mark. Um, and the majority of our uh, participants um, identified as uh, cisgender women. Um, the majority were um, uh, South, uh, were heterosexual, though we do have a pretty prominent amount of uh, queer LGBTQIA folks, um, Muslims that were part of the, our sample as well. Um, the majority of our sample was also South Asian in terms of racial and ethnic uh, groups, but you can see from the the the, um, the chart as well that it was still pretty diverse um, in trying to capture as many uh, racial and ethnic groups as we could. Um, and then in terms of education, 
the majority of folks had um, a bachelor's degree or higher. Um, so quite a highly educated um, uh, sample. And then finally, um, the majority of folks had over, or about a third of, of participants had over um, uh, 100K, uh, around 100K in terms of household income at that time. Um, that the household income is a little bit um, diverse as well, but um, it's definitely leaning towards um, some more of the upper uh, class um, in terms of social uh, socioeconomic status. Um, and I think if you go to the next slide, we should um, we should receive a poll question. There you go. And so it asks, how much of a problem do you think sexual violence is in your community? So I'm going to give folks a little bit of time um, to answer that. Um, and once I see not a lot of, of uh, respondents, I'll kind of share out what y'all think before going on into the next uh, major finding. Just give folks a couple seconds there. So I'm seeing a, mostly a lot or somewhat is what folks are responding. And I don't know if I can, I don't think I can show the, the poll itself, but yeah, about 46% of you all noted it's a lot, 31% said somewhat. So if you go to the next slide, I will share what we found in our study. And so kind of similar um, results, but we also asked three kind of stages of questions. Um, so we asked kind of a similar question, right? How much of a problem do you think sexual violence is in the large Muslim community? And the majority of folks, you know, responded with either saying very or extremely um, the level of, of a problem that it is in our, in our larger Muslim community across uh, the US and Canada. But then we also asked how much of a problem do you think sexual violence is in your local religious community? And it went down a little bit. Most folks responding with either somewhat um, or very, um, it's a little bit varied across the kind of different responses. And then when we asked how likely do you think you will experience sexual violence in your religious community? Most people said not at all um, and very much not kind of responding with the very or extremely. Um, and so we're seeing kind of a, a, a very, you know, different um, perceptions of sexual violence as it relates to, you know, kind of a broader theoretical understanding of sexual violence in our community versus more local and like experienced um, form of violence. And we'll get into this kind of discrepancy a bit more in our discussion as well. And so, um, when looking at the findings overall, um, we looked at um, sexual harassment, stalking, sexual assault, intimate partner violence, and overall sexual violence altogether. Um, I will note that like we had questions that were more specific that kind of um, were considered sexual harassment, specific ones that were considered stalking, uh, sexual assault, assault um, and intimate partner violence. So these are all um, composite uh, um, measures that we use to kind of just see the overall effect of um, how folks are experiencing violence. And so immediately you'll see that sexual harassment, most of our participants experience some form of sexual harassment. And that could include, you know, offensive sexual remarks, inappropriate comments about the body, crude sexual comments, mail or texted offensive remarks or any kind of unwanted pursuit. And then you'll see that stalking and sexual assault kind of um, hovered around the 50, you know, majority of folks still experience those as well. Um, uh, stalking includes unwanted messages causing fear for personal safety, someone showing up and waiting for an individual, which can cause, you know, a fear of personal safety or feeling that you're being spied on or watched by someone. Um, where, and then sexual assault included um, physical force or threat to penetrate, oral sex, kissing, et cetera, um, both the failed and non-failed attempts. 
Um, this could also include um, any kind of sexual penetration, oral sex kissing while incapacitated or unable to consent. And then it could also include any some kind of physical contact um, and and like threatening serious harm or reward uh, in that way. Um, and so intimate partner violence also was 28.4, a little bit less, but still um, prominent. And then the overall sexual violence, obviously, like based on what we've seen in the previous four, four kind of categories, majority of our participants experienced some form of sexual violence. And then we took all the same data and we looked at it across gender identities. Um, and so we particularly looked at uh, cis women, cis men, and transgender and gender nonconforming folks, um, and kind of wanted to see what um, how it kind of varied across those groups. And so generally, like the the trends are similar to the ones we had just seen, but um, again, within each group of um, gender category, uh, majority of folks are experiencing some kind of violence. But we wanted to kind of point out. Um, particularly that among the transgender not, and gender non-conforming folks, a lot of them are experiencing like, you know, 100% of those folks experienced some kind of sexual harassment um, or high levels of stalking and sexual assault um, and overall sexual violence. So we wanted to point that out as well. And then finally, we looked at sexual violence um, across sexual identities. And again, we were just focusing on heterosexual both versus um, queer Muslims. Um, and again, similar um, kind of trends in that uh, in within each group, they're experiencing high levels of sexual violence, but then particularly queer Muslims, even though not super high, high number in our sample, again, majority of them are experiencing some form of sexual violence, um, particularly harassment. And so we'll we'll chat about some of you know more into these these data points, but really wanting to focus on you know how widespread and persistent our sexual violence is in our communities, um, the differences in the perceptions of sexual violence, you know from the local the the kind of larger community versus local, um, and then kind of those differences across groups that we want to um, hold on to. And so I think we can probably end it there, and then we can open it up for the panel. Thank you so much, Yasmin, for taking us through the major data points of the study. I really want to start with um, my first question to Hadi and Yasmin, as you guys were part of the original research team that kind of started this process. Um, I really want to start with what was the process of developing the survey and what are some of the ways that um, you thought of the questions, you know, our Muslim communities are very sensitive to certain questions. So what what did you use to kind of, you know, go about it and, and what measures have you used to kind of collect this data? And I see Adi. Okay. I can I can start us off. Yeah, please. Um, Thank you. So yeah, some of the major things that we the kind of starting point, I think, for a lot of the survey questions started with um, the um, the national uh, national intimate partner and sexual violence survey, which we kind of noted in the beginning of the findings. Um, and so, a lot of the questions that we had around all the different experience, you know, asking about the experiences of sexual violence, all the very particular kinds of sexual violence that we asked folks to um, respond to. A lot of those came directly from the measures already used um, in the NISFIS um, survey. So that also kind of grounded us to be able to like um, compare um, to some extent, you know, what the what was happening nationally in the US through that survey, through those measures, and then comparing it with the measures that we had. Um, so th that would I would say that is kind of the major uh, point for those particular questions. Um, obviously the survey was like 150 questions. So there was a lot in there um, and we'll probably get into this a little bit later, but it wasn't just asking about sexual violence. It asked about perceptions. It asked about um, 
sexual dysfunction, which had its own uh, survey uh, or measures based on, um, I think the the female um, sexual function index. Um, it, we also had questions about spiritual abuse um, and um, questions around uh, perceptions to rape myths. And so the questions that like, you know, heavily relied on um, kind of those validated measures probably were the NISFIS and the um, female um, sexual um, dysfunction survey, sexual function index. Um, but kind of anything around like, you know, the rape myths that were particular to Muslim communities or the spiritual abuse questions that kind of came out of, um, you know, more lived experiences that we've, our heart and ourselves have, have all heard um, anecdotally that didn't have, you know, already validated measures from other surveys we kind of had to create organically um, and to make sure that they could be answered by Muslims and felt like they kind of could relate to those experiences in that way. Um, so lots of back and forth, lots of trying to like balance that like validated measures and what kind of we can use to compare between our sample and more mainstream samples, but then also making sure that there are questions that were really targeting, um, you know, really particular, unique Muslim lived experiences that we could start exploring um, through the survey. As someone who joined the, the team much later in the process when, when the research um, survey was kind of completed, I think one of the unique parts of this study to me is the inclusion of various gender identities within the Muslim community, which a lot of surveys that surveys Muslims just like has this blanket, you know, gender identities that doesn't really um, address the complexities of how Muslim Americans show up. So tell me a little bit more about the thought process that went into that. And yeah, just thinking about how some of the questions and how how it was framed. Yeah, I think that that's like a really important question about demographic questions in general, right? Like we're often using demographic questions that are like based off the, the census or, you know, again, these validated measures that are often validated by like white researchers that are not in, you know, using more inclusive samples um, to kind of garner those more um, unique uh, identities um, or characteristics of folks. Um, and so we want to be really um, intentional about having as, you know, as many and as clear um, uh, um, categories for the different demographic um, groups. So both, you know, and this includes both the um, gender identities, uh, sexual orientation, sexual identities questions, as well as the racial and ethnic um, groups that we included. Um, and I think it's also a matter of good method methodology to include um, kind of as specific as we can in terms of the different groups and noting the unique uniqueness of, you know, Muslim communities and knowing that we have interacted with these people and we we want to make sure that they're captured. Um, I've been in rooms oftentimes where we're talking when we're talking about survey design, we're thinking, oh well, like if people aren't going to actually answer that question or fill out that that um, um, identity category, why well, include it? But then we still end up missing those like nuances when there are folks that come up in our um, in our samples that kind of um, that do represent those unique groups in you know in our in our in our communities. Um, but it's also just to note like in many of the surveys that are particular to Muslims, there's like a phobia to think oh there could be this diversity of people within our communities. Um, and especially around um, gender and sexual identities. And so to be able to, you know, as a Muslim organization, doing a certain national survey for just Muslims to really be intentional about including all those categories for gender identities and sexual identities is also a nod to recognizing that these people exist in our communities, that we have um, all this diversity that we wanna make sure is included, even if the sample of it is small, that we can still say, yeah, these people exist and we need to make sure that they're included in our research because like we saw, they're experiencing high levels of harm just as much as, you know, the mainstream Muslim. Um, and so to, to be, 
you know, those are intentional choices that we made um, as a team that we wanted to, you know, make sure that that's also now a new precedent for upcoming, um, you know, other Muslim researchers or people that are doing research with Muslims, that they're including all those different categories as well, that we're not limiting ourselves in what we think our communities in, um, consist of. Nadia, I would like to ask that question to you as well. Um, the, like thinking from the work that we do at heart outside of like research, why was it important that we really include a diverse um, gender identity and sexual orientation as part of the question, a line of questioning for this research study? Yeah, no, thank you. Um, thank you, Sabrine uh, and Yasmin for sharing. Um, you know, I echo a lot of what um, Yasmin shared. Uh, I think for me, it was important just anecdotally, we were receiving disclosures from queer and trans Muslims. Um, and, you know, like, repeatedly, we were hearing the same story is like, either, you know, this happened to me, but I can't disclose because then I it's it's like a like I'm also outing myself as a queer person or a trans person. And so I can't I don't want to disclose the violence that happened to me because I'll have to disclose my identities. And then the other um, the other sort of pattern was, you know, I I'm a queer or a trans person. I've experienced this violence. And when I did disclose, I was shamed and blamed that this happened to me because of my identities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, or that I'm not Muslim enough. And so it was really important to us to not only visibilize the, the diversity in, in our communities, but also sort of, um, it's an invitation to, to, to our, the communities that we live, work and pray in to say that like, there is a significant um, part of our communities that, are not included or um, in, in research like this or are not included in conversation around gender-based violence because you know of our own um you know preconceptions or assumptions about you know queer and trans communities and um it's important um to disrupt that and to basically invite people to think about not only is this an important group that exists and that identifies as muslim and they are muslim because there's no one way of being muslim um and they also are experiencing a lot of violence and that is something that we cannot ignore if we are wanting to be a community that cares for each other and is in relationship with each other Thank you, Nadia. Um, my next question is to Hadi. Um, one of the major findings from the research studies, the discrepancy between perception and reality is something that we saw in some of the uh, data points that Yasmin just um, reviewed. So tell me a little bit about that process and in general, how, how have you handled kind of this information? Okay, so... Um... That's the interesting thing with like qualitative research. And by the way, y'all, I am not qualitative, quantitative research. I am a qualitative researcher and I'm so always interested in like, you know, stuff around perceptions. And one of the main things like you always tend to see is that we have a tendency to other the problem. So it's like, yeah, we see that, um, you know, sexual violence is happening, but there's no way it's happening in my community. It's just like, I know people that it's happening to, but they're not my people, that kind of situation where it's like, it's this, and, and also a lot of it is also like the stigma that's around sexual violence and just sexual and reproductive health issues in general within our communities. So we, um, because we don't talk about a lot of things and we just, again, we're in denial, it, it feels better to have the other communities be like the big bad monsters versus us. And then, so that also ends up being a problem because we, it's harder to solve a lot of the issues that we have because it's like you're not willing to admit that there are issues and there are problems. So um, yeah, it's quite it's quite interesting that that this is coming up in our data, and I think it's a good um because we were discussing it how like it would actually be a good like research opportunity to look at it qualitatively and to understand like where the root of the perceptions are coming from and how we can combat those um, perceptions and continue to do the work that we're doing in our communities. 
Thank you, Javi. Um, this is for the entire panel. Um, I one of the questions that I I've been thinking about is, as part of the analysis, um, you know, although the sample of the study was much smaller than the national NISPIS um CDC sample, we have saw higher rates percentage wise in sexual violence overall sexual violence. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what you think some of the reasons? for the increase, specifically when we're looking at our sample within the Muslim community in comparison to national um, averages? I can start off. I think it just ties into what I was talking about with um with the stigma around it. And um <laughs> sorry. And also I think not just a stigma, but also the Muslim community is quite understudied. So we've always had like a lack of data and a lack of information. So whenever like we do studies like this, where it's like, it's an exploratory study and it's, you know, one of the first of its kind, the data tends to be more like explosive. And then, you know, once you continue to do more of the research around it, then like it kind of, I feel like it kind of tapers off a bit, but also again, it doesn't take away from the fact that like, there's a lot of gendered Islamophobia as well. So a lot of the time, like women are scared to, Muslim women specifically are scared to report on sexual violence because of this idea that if you do that, then you're betraying your community and you're putting Muslim men in harm's way with like interactions with law enforcement. And yeah, you. so a lot of the time they tend to internalize that kind of, the, that violence, they tend to internalize that violence. And with anonymous surveys, you have the opportunity to talk about, you know, the violence that's submitted on you and you're able to, you know, yeah, talk about it without fully putting yourself out there. If anybody wants to add to that. Yeah, I think just following up, like it's that selected selection bias, I think, where like you're taking the survey because you you see yourself in that survey and want to be able to like um, have a space where you can maybe finally share this out and know that like you've shared it and there's, you've kind of released it in a, in a certain way. And it could be helpful for, you know, the researchers who are doing this work to kind of um, see kind of the overall impacts of that kind of violence. But there is that like shield of anonymity that people um, like to have. So I think that's also why, um, you know, our numbers are so high because people are, we tend to um, uh, attract folks that have experienced these kind of harms. Um, but it's still like a testament to how pervasive these these harms are, um, no matter how, you know, whether you compare the sample sizes or not, like these are still like individuals, a lot of individuals who have experienced some level of harm um, over their lifetime. I think that's um, kind of also understanding that that dynamic. Thank you. I really want to take us to talk a little bit about demographics. I, I really um, want to point out that big part of this research process started during the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic, which is still going on. Um, so during that time, um, a lot of people you know, yes, the survey got a lot of respondents in comparison, but there is still missing a lot of really key Muslim demographics and key Muslim communities. And I really want to ask the team who was, you know, part of the recruitment process, how were you trying to like figure out ways to challenge um, having a large sample size of like South Asian and Arabs um, only in the study? Should I go? Okay. Um, so I was part of the recruitment team. And um, I remember, again, like, you know, with Nadia, with what Nadia said, the um, we launched the survey and then COVID happened. And even when COVID happened, we also still had like, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement. And there were so many different things that were going on at the same time that it was really hard to reach um 
I guess, sample populations that were outside of the heart core, if that makes sense. Because um, we, we reached out to a lot of MSAs, we reached out to masjids, we reached out to shelters, we reached out to as much people as we possibly could. We did like Instagram lives, like we tried every kind of avenue that we could have exhausted virtually because like, you know, COVID and everything and heart is a virtual organization. So it was hard to do in-person recruitment. But um, I think we were, we did fall short with the diversity and we did try, like we pushed really, really hard, especially to get like a higher um, black Muslim population to try and just get like a more representative sample of the black Muslim population in the US. But it was quite difficult because I feel like there were competing interests at that point. Not competing interests, but also, yeah, competing issues <laughs> around Blackness and violence that, you know, that was being meted upon Black bodies in the U.S. around that time. So um, I'm hoping that, again, I'm just thinking about further research as always, and I'm hoping that, like, <laughs> the next time we're able to um, do research, we are even more conscious of recruiting different um different populations earlier on because i think we didn't realize just how um unbalanced the 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 data was until like towards the end of the data collection and then that's when we tried to like you know ramp up the recruitment so um it'll be important next time that we're able to recruit from certain um populations and certain subsets so minority populations in general, so more um trans and gender non-conforming people, more, you know, non-South Asian people, more low income folks, you know, people that are also like heavily impacted by violence, but don't really have access to talk about the violence that's being meted upon them, especially like in the um, you know, sexual sexual violence space. I think too, just to add like and I think this was kind of um, important and like an, a prevalent issue for any research that was done early in the pandemic was how how to like ask people for information at a time when things were already very heavy uh, nationally and, you know, personally for folks. And then to like still ask them to take a survey that was also long and um potentially triggering because of all the information that was asked of them. And so I think there was also kind of trying to balance the like, how much do we push folks to take the survey at a time that's already really heavy and then take a really heavy survey that might be like, bring up a lot of emotions and, and things for them. Um, so I think there is also kind of that component to wanting to be as diverse and like trying to exhaust as many options as possible, but then also recognizing that like, do we really want to push folks to like take the survey if it's feeling like a burden for them and it's literally called the burden survey um so you know like how do we you know how do you hold those things um and try and like take really good care of folks in like sharing out the survey and having enough question you know exit points in the survey itself that people could you know get out of it if they were feeling uncomfortable um and yeah, also, I think in terms of like, especially with um, trying to reach Black Muslims of like, not, you know, pushing too hard on our networks within Black Muslim communities to like, share out the survey when there is like, all these other things that like, how do you say those competing um, uh, kind of points of, um, of focus. Um, so yeah, there's, a, there's definitely a lot of tensions there but I think for where we were where we ended up I think there is like a lot to hold and like be proud of kind of what diversity we were able to garner at that time I also want to add Yasmin you just um hearing you speak just brought up something for me as well in terms of like just doing research in um you know spaces of violence sexual violence spaces or like I'm trying to remember the word, <laughs> but um, just doing research basically in communities that have undergone a bunch of different things. It what happens is especially like when we're talking about sexual violence specifically, 
and having it be like such an umbrella term for different things a lot of the time you see that people just assume that sexual violence means rape or some form of like you know that kind of physical something needs to happen so when you start giving folks the proper definition of what violence is and can be a lot of the time folks tend to realize oh I'm actually a victim or survivor of violence. And that tends to make things a lot harder <laughs> because now it's like, you just had this realization and how can you, you know, continue on answering questions around this when this is your awakening and you're, you know, you just finding out that what you went through was not okay. So it's, it's triggering, even though we tried to, you know, have trigger warnings and tried to have spaces for like people to breathe and stuff, you can't really account for everything. And so it also makes sense that a lot of the time people will start the survey and then just not continue it because, you know, you just never know what it brought up for them. Thank you both. Um, I also want to mention that this study was um, not funded. So that really um, one of the reasons why, you know, it took it took a while for us to kind of do some of the data cleaning and, and go throughout the processes. Um, I also want to mention that, you know, if, if more funding was a, a, available to heart, um, and our various partners, then th these types of research would have been more prevalent in our communities. Um, I see Nadia, you raised your hand. Yeah, I just wanted to add one real quick thing as Hadi and Yasmin were talking about like people answering the questions and not and like realizing in real time that this is something they've experienced. The other thing that we did notice in the data was the more specific the question got, the more likely we were to get an affirmative, you know, than a negative. So like if if the question was super generic, like, have you ever experienced sexual violence? You know, people would say no. But then if you got very specific and said, but have you experienced um, jokes about your body? people would say yes. And, and so like the more specific the question got, the more likely um, we were seeing the rates or the prevalence going up. And that's just something to be said about, you know, specificity and also the fact that uh, a lot of folks don't know how to define sexual violence or when they hear sexual violence, they think rape. Um, and if they haven't experienced that, then they haven't experienced it. And so it's just, um, it's a, it's an interesting thing to think about in terms of how we're going to uh, how this can inform like education and prevention programming um and just like you know really getting the the idea that sexual violence is an umbrella term and that it doesn't have to be rape to to like actually experience it and so there's a lot of room for education here for that and i Thank think that's you. where sorry i think that's where that like difference in the perceptions versus the actual lived experience came really was so prominent in our results because it was like they'd say no I, I have not experienced in the, you know this in my local community and yet our our levels of sex people experiencing any kind of sexual violence was so high so I think even you know we've kind of all kind of said this in some way like people are like learning things as they're going through the survey that are recognizing for themselves experiences that are were harmful that they might not have or they might not um you know say is a form of sexual violence um i think that's also kind of a how like wild it is to see that in the data itself and to to be i think that's a that's an um something to note for our survey development of like to be to have both perceptions and lived experiences within the same survey to see kind of that progression um in the data of how folks are, are kind of noting you know noting these experiences in real time and to be able to identify them as sexual violence in real time thank you um yasmin i want to ask a few questions to our research intern who really helped me personally with the visual report, Kara, um, one of my questions to you is how was kind of the process of taking the data, um, all the numerical information and kind of like creating this wonderful visuals for each finding point 
Um, and also I really want to, you know, this might feel like I'm putting on the spot, but I want this group um, to hear more about your capstone and how you plan to use um, the data and the findings from the burden study for um, your capstone and some of the future plans you have with the data. Um, yes. So for the visual report, um, I'm lucky. I think that the data was about was about prevalence of the sample. So it made translating it to visuals, I think, a little bit easier and translating it to more like a lay population um, easier than something like rate or um, risk could have been. Um, I think one of the things that came up that was interesting is like which variables um, made more sense like uh, to be like collapsed or like to be made composite variables. And a lot of the analysis had already like been done in terms of running the numbers. Um, I think the only part that came up was like maybe rerunning them to see if like it matched up with what I was looking at. Um, and there wasn't really variation in that. Um, but and then the process of that was then just like figuring out what is readable and like not getting so bogged down in the data being like I know the context and I know what the number is supposed to be but balancing like how much information does a person need to know do they need to know like every single percentage every single like um like n of like the sample or like the population that we're looking at and then for like my capstone it was exciting to take the data from the burden study and sort of get to do um, like sort of some next level analysis on it. So with like my advisor, we're doing multi more multivariable analysis on it um, and making connections with specific like demographics, like um, gender identity and sexual identity, and then looking at the outcomes um, of like sexual violence and the different sexual violence outcomes that was were referenced earlier. And is exciting because working with my advisor also who like works a lot with Muslim populations in public health space. She was like, this is like very rare and special data because not a lot, nothing like this really exists in the space. Um, and it was because it's also such like, it's a very like rich data set and there's a lot of things that could be done with it. And even though it's such like a rich data set with such a large, um, like number of respondents when we the original plan was to do a moderation analysis to get a better understanding of like the pathways that like influence what um does and does not lead to someone experiencing sexual violence even though the population was too small for us to retain the appropriate power needed to conduct that kind of analysis which kind of just highlighted also how like the fact that this was an unfunded study is already such a big deal, but like the need for there to be funding behind research like this that can go towards things like recruitment so they can be we hit a number that's closer to the NISVIS survey, for example. Um, so there can be that kind of analysis and can lead to like more actionable, even more actionable um, policies once we understand more about like the causes and like the pathways that lead folks to experience sexual violence. Thank you. Um, I think the reason why we were kind of bringing up funding and resources for these type of programming is that, you know, like taking on such intensive survey and like sitting down and, and I mean, if you're already at disadvantage, right? And you're having to just kind of figure out when it's appropriate time to take it. Um, a lot of folks, I mean, thinking about the traumatization of, of taking such a survey and having to relive some experiences that a lot of folks do not have the capacity to, to really deal with, but also um, I guess the kind of the fairness, right? When, when large research Fun, you know, when large research institutions um, do such pro programming or such research studies, they do have the funding to kind of like provide some incentives, you know, give participants money for their labor, um, give participants lunch, right? So um, provide transportation, provide some type of gift card forms. And that is something we did not have 
as part of like a small organization doing this process with uh, a partner org. So this is why we're as, you know, Muslim public health folks, we're like, we want funding. We have such great people doing this amazing programming, doing this amazing research. And in order for us to reach the those of us in our communities who do not have access, who are not highly educated, who do not have access to internet as you know, readily available, who, you know, we need those population in our research and we're not getting them because we don't have funding and we don't have, you know, ways to um, support them, right? Um, so yeah, that's kind of why we're kind of slowly bringing up funding in this conversation. Um, this is kind of for all, all the panel. Um, I guess, Nadia, I want to really start with you, but um, how is this research informing our programming at heart? Um, and how is it informing the way we interact with various Muslim communities around this conversation of sexual violence? Yeah, thanks. Um, so it's informing in a, in a number of ways. Um, you know, of course, we we kind of knew um, this, uh, the, like what the findings were anecdotally through our work. Um, and so the, you know, being able to have empirical data that supports it to say like, this is a study, um, you know, the fact that we used um, a survey tool that was validated and used by the CDC um, also um, gives credibility to um, to the survey itself, um, but really being able to say to the communities that we work with, particularly leadership uh, and community uh, community like organizations and professionals that serve Muslims, you know, it really visibilizes sexual violence um, for Muslim communities in ways that you know uh, DV and SV agencies have not been able to do in the past because of what was named earlier, which is they don't collect data around religious identity. So um, for the first thing, it just really visibilizes um, the unique group of Muslims and the diverse group of Muslims to say, you know, we're we're looking at one of the most diverse religious minorities in this country. Um, and the numbers that we, you know, uh, we're going to do future analyses on like race and class and education and all of that. But what we've seen so far through the initial analyses is that it doesn't discriminate. There is no, you know, it's happening across race. It's happening across class. It's happening across socioeconomic status, marital status. Um, so it's really important for um, the communities that we work with to understand how, um, prevalent it is in our communities uh, to be even wanting to, you know, uh, address it. And then the second thing I think is, in, in addition to that, then it's also um, an invitation to folks. What well, One of the things that we have, like, um, a bunch of different frameworks, and one of the frameworks we have is Respond with Rahma, which is Respond with Compassion. And it's like um, a framework that teaches people how to respond to disclosures. And one of the things that we say um, about that is that you know, everyone um, doesn't have to do everything when it comes to somebody disclosing, like we don't, everyone does not have to play judge and jury. They don't have to be the one who um, holds the, the perpetrator accountable or, you know, whatever, but everyone should know how to respond to a survivor. And that is because uh, most of the time, a lot of the times um, we have survivors come not forward to professionals, but they actually come forward to their parents, to their uh, to their neighbors, to their siblings, to their friends. And those are the folks that are like the first line responders to get these folks to the services and the help that they need. And if we don't train everyone um, to respond to a survivor with compassion and and understand the scope of the problem and where to get help, then a lot of times you're going to keep getting high rates of um, sexual violence, but low rates of reporting and disclosure. Yes, to everything Nadia said, I just wanna add like this one teeny tiny piece about how this research can also inform policy. So local policy, you know, national policy and all of that, just in terms of like getting um, providers to, be more 
sensitive slash trauma informed when dealing with survivors of different cultural contexts. So having that kind of um, you know, having that kind of lens and that kind of training, even like you know, outside of heart, but like heart being able to give this information that can then be used in a um, much la larger and much grander settings, I think is really um really, really important. Thank you both. Um, one last question that I wanted to ask, and then we can open up um, the, I mean, audience, if, if y'all have any questions, please drop it in the chat. Um, but one last question that I have for all of you, including Hira, is um, what are some of the future research ideas that you are thinking about. Um, I want us to kind of imagine some things that we want to work on as a heart team. Um, there are a lot of things that we're currently working on as well. Um, so um, yeah. Um, I see that Dr. Rahman is on. Dr. Rahman. Oh, hey guys. Assalamualaikum. Um, thank you for joining us. Of course. Um, um, if you can speak a little bit on the sexual dysfunction piece, actually. Yes, of, I, I, that was um, one thing that I really wanted to mention here, too, because, uh, you know, as a, as a sex med gynecologist, I do treat um, a lot of Muslim patients with sexual dysfunction, the majority, you know, around sexual pain, but of course, you know, um, arousal, orgasm, libido, all of that. And that was one of the things, you know, when I first spoke to the team was like, we really need to see what our prevalence rate is here because I see so much of it. I see so many. And we know that, uh, you know, statistically um, studies have shown that the degree of religiosity and, and sexual shame is sometimes associated with uh, female sexual dysfunction. So it was really awesome because we presented this data at a number of sexual medicine conferences now, and everyone has been so receptive of the fact that I'm so glad we have this data now to say that, okay, 40% uh, of women experience sexual pain in their lifetime. But, you know, the, the critical factor to me was like close to two thirds of those women never sought any medical management for their pain. Um, and some of the reasons given were, you know, um, shame and fear and distrust of the medical community and not knowing if, you know, we even had any, um, uh, treatments for this or not realizing that this was not normal for them. So I think that element, you know, is in and of itself unique. I mean, you know, we don't always, we can't always link, you know, sexual assault and history of that with sexual pain, although, you know, there is that association, but we see it a lot in the Muslim community, even devoid of that. So I think that to me, this, this part of the research was also very telling that, you know, the prevalence rates overall of sexual uh, dysfunction, um, you know, like 40% of women experience low libido in their life or hyperactive sexual desire disorder. But, you know, it's kind of all over the place for sexual pain. We don't have great statistics, but 40% for Muslim women is pretty high. I think that's, uh, you know, overall, you know, a higher, and, and, and I don't know that many, you know, I'm trying to do a deep dive to see if, because I also see a lot of Catholic patients with similar issues or, um, you know, uh, uh, religious Jewish patients, and I haven't seen much data on their prevalence rate. So for me, this was a very powerful aspect of our study, and it's going to inform some of the next, you know, obviously around sexual, um, uh, you know, abuse and spiritual abuse, you know, we're going to do some more research, but even just, you know, how do we negotiate, um, if we think a lot of the lack of sexual or the, if we think a lot of sexual pain is really related to lack of education, lack of knowledge, the lack of, you know, openly discussing this, um, you know, what are the interventions that we can really do to further um, to, to prevent this in the future? And I think that's some of the work that we're going to look into. We're going to look a little bit closer at um you know, this statistic as a whole of, of what it means to have that sexual pain and, and some more information around that. And we're going to expand the research to peri and postmenopausal women as well, who are often neglected in all research. But that was one of the things when I, when this research was presented that a lot of people were like, uh, you really cut out the midlife women here, doctor. <laughs> I was like, we just didn't realize, you know, we didn't know if we could, you know, you know, I, I, I don't know, like, we just thought these were the people that we could get but I think that going forward, 
we need to look at, you know, including midlife women in this as well, because they're also having sex. They're also having issues around, you know, menopause and the lack of, um, you know, hormone in the, in the vulval vaginal area and causing sexual pain. So I think, uh, you know, this was, you know, really, a really great piece of information. I think it's been quoted a lot. People are always asking me about this. Um, and, and to me, this was a big, big move in the right direction for, for, uh, Muslim women in the, in the research world. Thank you, Dr. Rahman. Um, I just want to also mention that we're currently, the heart team, um, we're currently in the process of writing, um, few papers that will be part of a, um, an, an American Muslim sexual violence journal, um, open access journal. Um, that looks at, you know, how sexual violence shows up in our Muslim communities. Um, and we are actually going to use some of the findings, um, the spiritual abuse and sexual violence findings um, as part of um, a paper that we're writing. So hopefully once that's published, we will share it in the larger um, community. Um, yeah, I, I see that we have 15 minutes. Um, if anyone has questions, please feel free to raise your hand. Um, or use the chat. Also, do be sure to check out our report uh, that Sabrine linked in the chat because there's a lot more um, in there in terms of results um, that we're hoping that everyone can look at. I will actually link it again because I think few people joined after. Did we answer all the questions? You have a bunch of uh, public health nerds here, so feel free to ask questions. If not, I can also continue asking questions. There's something in the chat, um, Sabrina, I can read it. Um, such important work for reproductive health in general and how incredible that it is shedding light on particular experiences in our communities. Thank you. I'm curious what the legacy of this work looks like. Has anything like this been done before for Muslim communities? What existing literature did you draw on to study the, to design the study? Hadi and Yasmin, that's all you. Do you want me to start? <laughs> okay. Um, so I kind of briefly mentioned it earlier um, when I was going through the uh, the like overview of the study. Um, but generally speaking, there was not a ton um, of research out there that um, was particularly focused on Muslims experiencing sexual violence. Um, a lot of the studies that we did find often were like very small samples um, or very like targeted, um, you know, very specific uh, groups. So like a lot of times it was often just Muslims or immigrant Muslims, Muslim women. Um, uh, and so that often, you know, we could only like pull on that to a certain extent. Um, I think um, one of the other, I mean, sometimes a lot of the, the research also was research that we had done before, that Hart had done before. Um, and so we often, you know, we, we referenced one of our um, colleagues, uh, Alia Asma, um, and the research that we did that she kind of spearheaded um, that focused on, you know, experience of sexual violence on Muslim, uh, like, college campuses. Um, but again, like, we were pulling from pretty, like, small amounts of, of data um, and literature. Um, and oftentimes, a lot of these studies also were mostly qualitative. Um, so a lot of interview studies or focus groups or, or things like that, which is super informative in terms of like the anecdotes and the exper lived experiences of folks, but to have something more um, quantitative that we can kind of do a bit more in terms of like comparative um, analyses just did not exist at a large scale. Um, and so that often was like 
a lot of that was the reason for us going in the direction of quantitative research because we wanted to be able to have like a breadth of information um, from one single survey. Um, and so that's kind of that legacy and it, it kind of what here I was kind of talking about too, of like, you know, even just hearing from other researchers that this data set is unique. Um, and as much as we wanted, you know, we wanted more folks to, um, to, to take the survey and respond to it. The amount of people that we did have and the, the breadth of information and like how large the, you know, the survey was and the amount of questions that we were able to ask that still people were able to respond to, um, I think, um, uh, what was kind of the the major point of the study, um, trying to get as much so to explore as much as we could um, in a single um, a single survey, um, and so we're hoping that also this can be a jumping off point for uh, sorry for other researchers, Muslim researchers that are doing similar work, that they have also that precedent that they don't have to feel like they have to rely on so called validated measures, but there's something like our work that they can kind of model off of. Um, and we've kind of seen that with Queer Crescent has done a similar survey, particularly for queer Muslims. And a lot of, there was a lot of kind of conversations with them of like, how did you make your survey? What questions did you ask? And like, so there is that like um, desire also on our part for uh, for other researchers to, to utilize um, what we've created and, and make it you know, expand it and and really, you know, target it in certain ways or um, what have you. Plus one to everything that's being said, I just wanted to add that um, even the data that we did find was not, there was barely anything in the U.S. So it was always like data that was international. It's always like small focus groups or small interviews. So there was nothing like that was actually fully expansive. So it felt like pulling hairs <laughs> trying to do the um, literature review because there was like, you know, very limited information and very small sample sizes and everything was, how do I put this? It just wasn't applicable to a lot of our context because even when, um, with a, I'm just thinking about like some of the studies that we saw, a lot of it would be like, okay, like Muslim refugee populations in a certain community or, you know, populations in like domestic violence centers or something, but it was like, or like populations in universities. So it was always like a cohort within like a, a cohort that's been studied. So it was like very rarely, maybe now, things might have changed, but like around the time that we started doing the literature review and all of that, there was next to no information. And even when you look at um violence in religious communities, a lot of stuff that came up was about like Catholic Christian communities. So even then, like, cause we, you know, we're doing research on spiritual abuse and a lot of it is like, we have to take from other faith communities and then be like, okay, this is what is out there. But like, this is why we're trying to find it out for our Muslim communities. So it's it's a very difficult um yeah it was quite difficult to 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 come up with like the literature review and you know to to just get the the data and the information so this is why also it's like very very important that we're doing this study so now it's like there is when there's going to be other studies we have something to build off of. Thank you to all the researchers and um, well, all the work that you've done. I really want to add to the part of like the literature. Um, just thinking back about personally, when I was like interested in, in doing research at, at school and stuff like that, a lot of when we would look at research and violence in um, Muslim communities, um, the umbrella of Muslim communities does not exist, right? A lot of researchers love to kind of tokenize certain aspects of certain Muslim communities and kind of highlight it as a Muslim problem. And that's kind of what we see in a lot of the literature review when you're looking at, you know, gender violence in general, and sexual violence in Muslim communities. So thinking about um, issues of like certain communities practice this, right? you know, FGM, honor killing, all things like that. Um, and that's kind of what the a lot of the data is is pushing and showing and not thinking about the generalized experience of 
uh, sexual violence, gender-based violence within the American Muslim context, within the North American Muslim context, and tends to kind of hyper fixate on like one aspect, which I think, I mean, you know, FGM, FGC is a major problem in a lot of Muslim communities, but it's not a Muslim community problem. But the data tends to kind of present it that way. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that. Um, if anyone in the audience has any questions, we do have a few more minutes. Um, thank you to everyone who joined and hopped out. Um, yeah. We do have a um, few questions. Nadia, do you want to? Oh, in the yeah, last cool. I minute, forgot about it. Um, release some of the questions. Yeah, hold on. Okay. So it's about 80% who have seen cultural practices that perpetuate sexual violence. And then just one last question. hundred percent no surprise um but thank you everyone for joining this was really um really uh nice to be in community together and we will be putting up the recording on youtube um for anybody who wants to see it afterwards um but really grateful for all who were able to join and um especially to the research team who was able to share the conversation or share the results have a great day Thank you all. Thanks, Thanks folks. So